Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lloyd Lesperance. I am the Chief of Staff and Chief Operating Officer here at the Freelancers Union at the Freelancers Hub. Today, I'm joined by two special guests, Mita Karaman, founder of Eventually, and Tariq Kolusi, who's the founder of Nomads Giving Back and Nomads Skillshare. I would like to give you a little background about the Freelancers Union before I pass it over to our two guests to introduce themselves. The Freelancers Union is a large organization that represents freelancers across the United States. We have roughly about 500,000 members in which we provide resources um, such as health insurance and life insurance and things of that nature, but we also provide advocacy for freelancers. It, so as such, we've advocated for non-payment protections for freelancers so that freelancers could get paid on time here in New, York, in New York State, and we recently passed it in LA and are looking to pass it in other states and cities around the country. Um, beyond that, we've also um, advocated for retirement benefits for freelancers, among other things. But that's just a few things um, about the Freelancers Union. But now, I would love to hear a little more about our guests. So I will turn it over to Mita to introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit about the event today, and we'll take it from there. Thank you, Lloyd. Hi, everyone. I'm Mita Karaman. I'm the founder of Adventurely. And why we're doing this live stream is because it's a part of a really cool, I think, experiential event um, that we're putting together from Adventurely. We brought in some fantastic partners who are with us here today. And this event is called the New York City Nomad Village Pop-Up Event. So a quick backstory is right now there's a new conference that's happening in New York City called New York City Tech Week. I mean, New York kind of always has a tech week <laughs> unofficially, but this is like an official one and they're doing it really big. And so the, the gist with this conference were that, you know, different brands and people could submit event ideas. And I was thinking, wow, you know, these nomad villages have become very popular. You know, the first one was created in Madeira, Portugal. It was very popular. And usually with nomad villages outside of the United States, the idea is to try to attract travelers to revitalize areas and, and build community around co-working experience and things like that. So in the context of America and New York City, I thought it could be really interesting to flip the model upside down. You know, there's been a lot of news and, and discussion coming out about digital nomadism. And now that it's gotten so popular after the pandemic and remote work, there's been a little bit of a backlash sometimes with nomading. You know, there's some destinations that are complaining that, you know, some of the nomads that are coming from, you know, various countries, America, you know, um, <laughs> maybe they're not being on their best behavior. Um, Maybe they're being a little bit in a bubble. They're not connecting with the locals. Maybe, you know, and then on the other hand, there's so many American nomads. Um, and by the way, there's about 35 million um, digital nomads around the world and the largest amount come from America. There's many digital nomads from America that want to be better. Um, they want to share their resources in different destinations um, and they want to find ways and methods and learn how. So long story short, the concept for the New York City Nomad Village is about exporting nomads to other places. How can we create discussions around that? And two of the first partners that I was so excited to bring on was Freelancers Union and Freelancers Hub. Deeply honored to work with you and somebody who I considered a friend and who I respect very much, Tarek from Nomads Giving Back and Nomad Skillshare. Um, so I'll just do the quick intro just outside of New York City Nomad Village. Um, again, the founder of Adventually. At Adventually, our mission is to connect digital nomads to each other and to their new local communities through our ecosystem of services and products. And we aim to do that with thoughtfulness around sustainability and local impact. I am actually a native New Yorker, originally from the Bronx. During my adult years, before I was a digital nomad, I was living in Brooklyn course. Um, <laughs> I've been a digital nomad for five years straight across, I think, 20 countries, something like 65 Airbnbs, over 100 different hotel nights. Um, and uh, we were kind of just talking before the panelists about like a fun fact we could share before we start. So fun fact about one of my favorite restaurants to eat at in New York is a place called Warriji. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but it's this little Korean spot that's um, by Herald Square and it's awesome. So um, Tarek, you wanna introduce yourself now? Yeah, absolutely. So great to be here with all of you. Uh, thank you Lloyd for hosting the panel today and Mita for this amazing initiative. Uh, you know, I spent the last decade of my life being a nomad 
and the previous one living in New York City. So seeing New York and, and uh, Nomad together in one place really makes me happy. Um, my name is Tarek Kalusi. I'm the founder of Nomads Giving Back and Nomad Skillshare. And we are a global community and social enterprise of more than 100 volunteers and ambassadors, amazing people all around the world, rallying behind a shared mission. At Nomads Giving Back, we're all about inspiring you to connect more locally and give back to the communities that you call home away from home. And at Nomad Skillshare, we're all about empowering you to learn the skills to live the life you imagine, focusing a lot on teaching remote work skills. And uh, I, like I mentioned, I spent uh, I, actually a dozen years in New York City right out of college, lived mostly in the East Village and Greenwich Village, a little in Brooklyn. Um, and I really miss it. It's, it's the most amazing city. You know, it's probably one of the only places in the world where you can actually feel like you're exploring the world without actually leaving your own city. Um, I'm talking to you from beautiful Mama Bali in Indonesia. It's uh, a little past 11 p.m. And uh, I wish I was with you in person, but I'm with you in spirit. And yeah, my favorite restaurant. So I happened to live for eight years in the village right above this incredible Thai restaurant called Si. Um, and I probably ate there like five times a day. <laughs> so, and ironically, um, right outside my window for those eight years was this restaurant with a big sign outside staring at me that said, no mat. Uh, it's still there. Amita actually uh, mentioned it to me the other day and I told her that I lived right across the street. Um, and funny enough, my name Tarek, I found out years after becoming a nomad actually literally means nomad. So I think it was a uh, destiny for me. That's amazing. Um, well, thank you both for the intro. Um, and I would like to just jump right in and ask the first question. So um, Mina, let me, I'll post this to you first. What is a digital nomad in your opinion? Okay. So there's a lot of different uh, definitions of what a digital nomad is, um, and people have their own interpretations. So I think for we're going to just define it for the purposes of this event. So for the purposes of this, of this event, a digital nobody, a digital nobody, a digital nomad, <laughs> not a digital nobody, you're a digital nobody. A digital nomad is somebody who slow travels while they work remotely. That's it. They slow travel while they work remotely. And in my personal opinion, digital nomadism can be experienced across a spectrum of accommodation, you know, whether it's very sort of like um, high end or maybe you're sort of more of a budget. And I think now the way that digital nomadism has evolved, it's also experienced across a spectrum of duration. So pre-pandemic, a lot of digital nomads, they were traveling in short sprints of time, but now you're seeing digital nomads stay way much longer and become so-called slow mads, you know, six months, maybe even up to a year. I mean, there's some people who feel that once you're doing up to a year, you're not necessarily a digital nomad. But I think that with the way that things are evolving around the world and the way that a lot of digital nomad visas are being positioned, that I'm okay with saying that. Um, so yeah, that's how I've defined it. And Tarek, how do you, how do you define it? Yeah, well, of course, I agree with Mita. You know, a nomad is someone who works remotely while traveling. Uh, but I also like to offer up a, another poetic definition that I really love. You know, many people believe that a nomad is someone who has no home. But I really like to believe that a nomad is someone who believes the entire world is their home. You know, like a true global citizen. Great. So um, I'm going to follow up that, Tariq. I want to ask you a second question based off that. Um, why is digital, why is the digital movement gaining momentum and why are freelancers interested in it, in this freedom of movement? Yeah, sure. So that's a really good question. You know, I actually worked remotely for a bunch of years before leaving New York. And when I started traveling, I saw the opportunity, uh, when I met these digital nomads that were working remotely in places like Bali, where I am now. And I was just amazed that more of the world wasn't catching on. I mean, it was growing fast. There's a study that said the no number of nomads grew by 50% the year before the pandemic. Um, but as we all know, the with the pandemic, it really forced the uh, massive adoption of remote work among, you know, most of the world. So, you know, the two macro forces that were holding it back before were governments and big business. And now governments are rolling out 
visas. There's more than 50 of them now that rolled out visas to, to attract nomads and remote workers and freelancers around the world because now they're competing for talent. And, and secondly, big business. So, in, you know, it feels like in the old days, even though it was just a few years ago, that we were kind of anchored to the office. Um, but many of these big businesses are now saying there's no office to go back to. So I really believe, you know, it's not just about cost arbitrage. Of course, we all want a higher quality of life for a lower cost of living. But there's just so many more benefits that I'm sure we'll get into of what it's like to have that freedom to choose where you want to live and explore. Great. And, and Mita, what do you think? Um, about that. Yeah, I think that a lot of people are trying to redefine what a work-life balance or what I consider a work-life integration means to them. Mm -hmm. um, I was a freelancer for about, I don't know, maybe 10 years in New York before I started to um, nomad on the, on the road and uh, freelance. And one of the, the benefits that I love about freelancing is that I can set my own hours because I personally am not necessarily the best, most productive at certain times of the day, which may necessarily align with traditional office hours. So I was already sort of adjusting to creating a life that works for me where I can bring my best self to work. And um, because, you know, I had my own business, I had my own small law firm in New York. I mean, running a business, being a lawyer, it's a very stressful thing. And when I was able to do that while digital nomading in places like Croatia, Istanbul, Mexico, you know, and and have the ability to integrate adventure and fun. I found that I felt better. It enhanced my wellness. Um, and I was actually surprisingly way more productive at work. Mm -hmm. It kind of became this thing where it's like I was even more incentivized to get my work done that much quicker so that I could have that much more free time on the weekends to go explore and find adventure. Great. And I have a follow up question for both of you. Um, how has the pandemic affected digital nomadism and has, do you think that's increased it or do you think it's changed it in any way? And I'll, I'll leave it to me to first. Oh, I think the pandemic has been like rocket ship fuel that poured <laughs> on digital nomadism. <laughs> so, um, I started working on Adventurely, uh, in 2019, um, we got funded by Backstage Capital mm -hmm. and I was like, look, I, I was trying to tell my investors, this is going to be the way. And, you know, they, they believed in me at the time and I was really happy for that. But there were a lot of people who were like, eh, I think this nomad thing is going to stay a little niche. Um, it's going to be a fringe thing, but, um, yeah, the pandemic just opened up <laughs> box. Um, and one of the interesting things that I did during the pandemic, um, because I was heartbroken when the pandemic happened for a number of reasons, not only because of the, the emotional and physical toll it was taken on people, but I mean, if I'm going to keep it under that real, my entire industry crashed. It was right. at, a, at a screeching halt right when I just got it started. But one interesting thing happened, Barbados decided to launch a digital nomad visa in the middle of the height of the pandemic. And I decided, you know what, I think I'm gonna level up and go down there. So this is around July of 2020 when most people were still at home. I went and got a hazmat suit and I got on a <laughs> flight and I got down to Barbados and it was my first time experiencing digital nomadism post pandemic and my mind was blown. And the reason why my mind was blown was because pre pandemic, it was mostly freelancers, but Post pandemic, I feel like you're seeing way more employees now that are doing this. If they have like a remote work policy um, at their job, I was seeing a lot more families come down. That was something new. Um, I, what I saw was what I believe is the normalization of nomadism and nomadism entering the mainstream. Great. And Tere, what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree with Mita on this. I think. You know, I mentioned how governments and big business are now making it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And those are the two macro forces that were kind of reluctant to it before the pandemic. You know, I think what's interesting, just to add a little bit different color to it, mm -hmm. the, the makeup of the nomad movement, I think, is, is shifting and also the speed of travel. Um, you know, for a little while, there is a lot of travel restrictions. So that slowed down a lot of people because it was just like worth, not worth the headache to move around as fast as they were. Yeah. Um, but I also think that the makeup, there's going to be a lot more, and it, it, we're already seeing this, like professional white collar people that already have fixed jobs that they're just working remotely as opposed to these entrepreneurs and freelancers that are, um, you know, the, the way it, it used to be more primarily. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I think 
people are going to want to slow it down because there's a lot of transactional costs in terms of moving around and not just money, but like time and energy and focus of like planning your travels, the flights, the hotels, right. all those arrangements settling in. So I think the average duration will be a lot longer. Probably instead of like one, two, three months, it'll probably be more like three, six, maybe even nine to 12 months. And I think that's actually good. I think it'll be good for both the, the nomad themselves, but also the local communities. I think the more that people spend time integrating and assimilating, the more likely they're going to leave, leave the place better than when they arrived. Great. Um, so I want to jump in and talk a little bit about your stories. And since there might be some freelancers here in our community that are interested in becoming a digital nomad, and um, in Mita, you mentioned that you were practicing law before you started eventually um, here in New York. So how did you make your digital nomad experience happen? Like what prompted you to do it and what got you to get going? Okay, so there was a number of things happening personally. Um, you know, I have to just share it because that's the only really way to communicate what I was going through. Um, unfortunately, I lost both my parents to cancer within like a year and a half here in New York. And um, that really changed the dynamics of New York and the dynamics of, you know, my family as well. You know, my mom was like that aunt that always organizes the entire family. You know, that one aunt that everybody's like, oh, let's go to aunt so-and-so's house. Yeah. So it was just such a drastic change. And, you know, being a native New Yorker, there was just so much of New York that was just weaved into my family. And I just felt the need that I really need to switch physical locations. That was the first thing. The second thing that was interesting in my law practice, I had a client who was a digital nomad. Hmm. Um, and, you know, because I was her lawyer, you know, I get to see what's actually going on behind the business on the back end. And, you know, she was getting her work done. She was closing deals. But then she was also on Instagram in places like Thailand and like hmm. Guatemala being like, you know, hashtag office of the day and living this life. So it kind of planted the seed. And then like the cute thing that happened was, you know, my lease was up in Brooklyn um, and I was like, oh, you know, let me try this out for like a couple months. And it's been <laughs> five years. But, you know, one thing I also want to stress is, you know, there's some nomads who, you know, they're just going indefinitely and they don't necessarily keep that strong of a relationship back with the United States. You know, mm -hmm. I'm back in the States at least once a quarter, sometimes once a month. I'll be back again for Thanksgiving. So, you know, it's it's different. And Turek, what about you? Yeah, so going back to 2013, um, a lot of people don't believe me when I say this now, uh, but I used to be a corporate soon tie kind of guy bouncing around the skyscrapers. Now I'm more of a hippie, <laughs> with the long hair and everything. <laughs> Bali will do that to you. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I think, you know, I was, I moved to New York right before 9-11 and uh, lost my job pretty quickly on with the economic crash that happened. And I just found myself really prioritizing professional growth over, over my personal well-being and wellness. And when I eventually started making enough money, I realized that I wasn't feeling as fulfilled. And then in 2013, um, I'll give you the quick version. There was four serendipitous moments that happened. Um, like, like Mita, I had a loss in the family. My cousin, who's on my age, died. And for me, that was kind of a wake-up call about what kind of life do I want to live. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was going to run my very first marathon, the New York City Marathon. Wow. And that was the one and only time they canceled it because of Hurricane Sandy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, that was kind of a... A tough experience too living in new york city during hurricane sandy there was a blackout for four days people died and um that was also kind of a wake-up call then i did run that first marathon two weeks later in the city of my birth philadelphia and many in many ways that was like a rebirth for me because i felt like that was impossible you know for in my path in my in this lifetime and feeling like i can do the impossible in one part of my life i thought maybe i can do the impossible in another part of my life um and the fourth thing that happened was i was walking um in, in uh, Cooper, Cooper Square uh, to my flat one day and this woman was moving her boxes across the street. They were falling off on her trolley. So I offered to give her a hand. Uh, long story short, she was living my dream life. She said that she went off and just explored a hundred countries and that she's gonna go off now, go after her second dream to create a social enterprise. And I, my mind was blown that this, you know, everyday hero was living my dream life. So those four things together Kind of gave me the inspiration to make a big change in my life and buy that one-way ticket and take a leap into the unknown um yeah and been doing this ever since wow that's incredible so both of you i want to say are 
you're both really brave for taking this huge step and making this jump. And we've talked about all these great things about the nomad life. But I have another question I want to pose to you. Is the digital nomad life hard? Is it difficult and why? And I'll let whoever wants to go first on that. Nita? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, I think there's an adjustment period that's needed. I don't think this is something you just, hey, all right, it's Tuesday. I'm just going to be a digital nomad. I mean, there's a little <laughs> bit, you know? I think, I think it does take a little bit of planning. I think the hardest part is actually just making the decision to do it because, you know, I had sort of just been like sitting on the idea after I saw my client do it. And then I was like, all right. And, and the, the, the step that actually is like, okay, this is, you're in it is booking that plane ticket. That's, that's the first step. When I booked that plane ticket, there was this like energy that I felt like, oh, wow, this is about to go down. <laughs> it's going down. And like, I just, I, yeah, I mean, okay, you're going to have to just take certain things with a grain of salt. Also, like, you know, different destinations, they might have the things that always work or don't work, just like New York, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you go out to dinner, you might see a couple rats come by, you know, visiting <laughs> outside in New York, hopefully not. Um, if you're in certain parts of the world, maybe you have to get used to the electricity going out. I mean, that yeah. happens to me quite a lot in Mexico. That happens to me quite a lot when I was at Istanbul, um, you know, you have to get used to like different modes of transportation. Like, okay, so I spent some time in Bali. Um, I'm not really a motorcycle type of chick. And so like the whole, like, um, <laughs> it, it didn't work for me. I was like the only chick in Changu that was taking cabs. Cause I didn't love them. <laughs> <laughs> like going on a motorbike. So I think there's an adjustment period for that. Do I think it's beyond anybody's reach to adjust to? No. And I think that once once you get the hang of it, you're like, I'm just gonna keep going and going. I don't know, Tarek, what do you what do you think when people say it's oh, 100 percent hundred percent. I mean, as with as with anything, change is hard, but that's the point, right? Like we all know that we grow outside our comfort zone. And and you know these these big changes are can be scary, of course, but you know I think it's one of those things where we just kind of have a leap of faith and know that everything works out the way it's supposed to. And you know, for me, like life as a nomad in the beginning, one of the things that was challenging was living out of a bag. Like everything I owned, I was living out of a bag for seven, eight years, wow. and that kind of forced me. And I used to be a pack rat. So it really forced me to adopt this minimalist lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And then I realized there's so many benefits of being a minimalist, you know, a lot less decisions to make, um, saving money, focusing more on experiences rather than things. And there's a lot of studies that show that that leads to a happier life. Um, and another thing is it can sometimes be lonely. And I talk to other nomads, um, especially when you arrive to a new place, you don't know anyone. And especially if you're more of an introvert than an extrovert. But for me, I realized that, that really helped me grow in terms of putting my voice out there, um, reintroducing myself, making friends. And then now, you know, after years of doing it, it's very, it becomes a lot easier to just, you know, create your own community. Um, and I, you know, honestly, if, if I never became a nomad, I wouldn't be doing this right now because it's one mm -hmm. of those things where you really do grow your confidence and, and learn more of what your true authentic voice is all about. Do you have something else to add to that, if that's okay? Yeah, go for um, it. One thing that I'm finding hard is um, stereotypes about digital nomads, mm. um, as well as media mischaracterization. So oftentimes, sometimes I read these like media articles about, you know, the digital nomad lowdown. They're going to go do an investigation and they're reviewing a demographic that's not a digital nomad, you know. So some... I think a demographic that the media often confuses us with are backpackers. So like to me, a backpacker is somebody who's literally just traveling the world and they're not working. Yeah. That's their goal is just to fully focus on travel. Whereas like a digital nomad, you have that element of work. So, you know, and then the stigma, you know, sometimes there are people who think that I'm like at some hostel every night getting drunk. And it's like, I don't even drink that much. I'm not staying in a hostel. I'm staying in an Airbnb or I'm staying in like Sonder, some like whatever, you know. And, um, you know, during the week, it's actually pretty tame, at least for established nomads. Um, the thing is this, I think you do need to have a little bit of a heightened level of organization skills if you're going to do this on the road. Um, and it's definitely a place where you can um, uh, improve that. But if you see somebody who's nomading and they've been doing this for a long time, 
they're getting their work done because you don't want to be stuck out in the middle of nowhere in some country without your money, you know, in place and your finances mm -hmm. together. So most digital nomads, real digital nomads, they're getting their work done. So that's, that's the other hard thing I would say, the stereotypes. Interesting. Um, yeah, really interesting. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about your all's relationship with the U.S. So I know, Mita, you mentioned that you come back every quarter or so, and then that a lot of times, you know, when you're overseas or somewhere else, you stay on Airbnbs. But Tarek, um, since you've been out of the country for a little longer, I'm going to ask you, what's been your relationship with New York and the U.S.? Do you, return, do you still return often? And how do you guys, like, how do you manage housing? How can a digital man, uh, nomad manage housing if they have a leasing in New York or somewhere else in the United States and are traveling around the world? Yeah, sure, sure. So in my case, when I left um, nine years ago, I actually um, didn't have my own. I mean, I rented in the city, but I didn't own a place. So for me, it was just leaving when my lease was over. So that was pretty simple. Mm -hmm. And in terms of my relationship, I actually barely went back. Um, I went back for two of my best friend's weddings over the years, and there was a, a seven-year gap in between the two, mm -hmm. um, which is wild, because uh, when I went back six months ago, walking around the city, uh, my mind was blown with like so many flashbacks to my past life, and you know, it's, it's really interesting to see your old life with a new lens, mm -hmm. and you don't know if the city changed or if you changed, I'm sure it's both, but <laughs> it was mm -hmm. definitely a... Uh, a fascinating experience to go through and i have so much love for new york city in the u.s uh it's uh, i just felt like you know when i was living abroad you know i had this personal mission along the way to explore 100 countries and so there's a big world out there and i've already spent a, you know most of my life in the u.s so i figured why not uh you know make the most of it by living abroad as much as i can thanks and Mita, what about you? I mean, you're a native New Yorker, so how does your relationship work? And how do you manage like the, this expensive city? Okay, so there's a couple of things. Um, I think it's a lot easier to manage maintaining a relationship with the United States now in the post-COVID digital nomad world versus before. And the reason why is because there's just way more products and services available where you can sort of hybrid between the two. So like um, if you're not ready to like nomad for like months on end, there are a number of different remote work and travel programs that you can do for like a month at a time. Mm -hmm. So a really well-known one is remote year and like they do this thing Thing where you can buy like an all-inclusive package and they do everything. Um, one of the products and services that we offered eventually is called a welcome meetup. So with a welcome meetup, it lasts for one month. You book your own accommodation and we organize all of your community activities with a group of 10 to 20 uh, like-minded people for you to experience while you're down there. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if you, you know, you're strategic about where you do this and you're planning to do this for a month, is it going to be a little expensive? Sure, because it's going to be addition, but you know, it is possible to still maintain your apartment and your lease back there. Um, obviously, if you have uh, an understanding with your landlord where you can sublet it, that's something also. It's another interesting product um, called My Place, which is a home sharing platform. So if you go on there, you can um, just explore ways to just, you know, switch off homes with your, your community of friends. Um, and then um, in terms of what I'm doing right now, you know, if I'm so like right now, I'm staying in a hotel while I'm up here. But um, sometimes I'll rent an Airbnb when I'm back or oftentimes I'll stay with family. And, mm. you know. That's something I want to mention is that, you know, there's a little bit of privilege with that being able to say, hey, I'm just going to stay with my family in New York. Actually, there's a lot of privilege with that. <laughs> um, and I recognize that, you know, not everybody has that. Mm -hmm. um, but so for those who don't have the ability to say, oh, I'm just going to, you know, stay with such and such family member, um, maybe some of the shorter term programs um, or finding like a, a, a network home sharing um, platform might be helpful. Great. Um, so how do you I say that? Yeah, I love that. Just one yeah. quick comment. What I found, you know, cause I also of course want to stay connected with my family who I love so much. Um, mm -hmm. but what was really interesting is that rather than me going to them, they would often come to me or we would go to a, a third destination where neither of us were. Um, nice. and it's a great way to bond with your family is to actually step outside of the normal environment that you see them because then you're actually having an experience together and it can create uh, beautiful time. 
I actually want to add one more thing about why I maintain such a relationship with New York. And it's not just because I'm a native New Yorker. After like, I mean, I don't know how many countries off the top of my head I've visited, but after traveling for five years, I can say with certainty, there is no city like New York. No matter no matter what nonsense is going on in New York, just, just when you get Amen. off the plane, it's just like an injection of energy, ambition, ideas. And I will always maintain a relationship with New York because of that. I love New York. Yeah, I support that. <laughs> um, Best city in the world. <laughs> so you you both traveled and stayed in, I would assume, absolutely beautiful countries like Indonesia and Barbados and things like that. You know, and probably stayed at a, somewhere near a beach and things like that. So how do you stay productive when you're on the road or abroad as a digital nomad? Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Um, well, in terms of the idea of remote working, I had a lot of experience doing that beforehand, so I didn't have to go through that learning curve. Um, mm -hmm. And there are a lot of these co-working hubs, these places where people come together and work together and, um, that a lot of people find useful to have a bit more office setting, even on the beach. Um, I would say, yeah, there can be a lot of distractions. You know, there's just so many amazing events. And if you're moving around quickly, there's a sense of urgency. Like, I only have two weeks here, one month here, you want to experience everything. So I think it's about having some resilience um, and understanding what your goals are, what your why is. And if, if, if for me to growing adventurally or with me growing no one's getting back, we're so passionate about what we're doing that we, we know that we need to follow through on our, on our dreams. Um, and in the meantime, if I found over the years, it's a lot more effective to not move around so quickly. Um, mm. So that way you can actually you know, balance all those different competing priorities in our lives. Um, it's so, it's so to, to, to sum up, it it takes a little bit of practice, but mm -hmm. that's kind of like the fun of life, right? We all want to do so many things, and it's a matter about figuring out how, how to optimize everything, you know, your, your per professional path, your personal path, and everything else. Yeah, I would agree with what Tarek said about the slow mad life. Also, I'm way more productive if I'm going to be somewhere for a month, two months versus like, um, you know, just a two week stint. Um, so when it's, when I'm going to stay like a month plus, you know, the first week is just about getting settled mostly, you mm -hmm. know, I'm going to do the big grocery shopping and, you know, make sure I find my little comfortable nook to get work done, you know, in, in the apartment. Another thing that I like to do um, for aspiring nomads, um, my first two days in a destination is usually just for me to explore. Like, I just love grabbing like Google Maps and just going right into the city center and getting lost and just getting some quick FOMO out of my, my, <laughs> my, 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 my veins. Um, so that's something that I do. Um, another thing that I do to stay productive on the road, and this is just as, you know, somebody being self-employed or period. I try not to take meetings on Mondays as much as possible. Um, uh, I, I also tend to work on Sunday nights. It's, it's a very like Zen practice for me to just sort of like very casually like plan out my week without, you know, a lot of fuss or a lot of rush. And then Mondays just try to be meeting free. Um, and then the other thing that I do, and I think it's really important for digital nomading is even if you don't go to a co-working space full time, I think you should at least be aware of where to find one in case there is an electricity issue. Mm -hmm. So I am the type of person where I need to get up, I need to change, I need to leave the house, I need to go to a desk somewhere else that's not home. So I'm almost always at a co-working space um, abroad. Um, and if for some reason I'm not, I know where one is because there's been times where it's like, are you kidding me? There's like a whole district power outage right before mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do this, whatever. Um, and, you know, you can hop in a cab and get there very quickly. Uh, so those are some of my productivity tips. And then in general, digital nomading to me is a productivity hack, you know, because again, it's like the incentive to get your work done so you can go explore this mountain and pyramid or mm -hmm. sacred place in Bali. <laughs> hundred percent. So what, what are some personal tools that are essential for getting work done while working abroad? Yeah, sure. So, you know, there's the usual obvious ones like the laptop, the phone, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. I would say what I found in terms of hardware is like, it's great to have uh, a nicer camera. Like I have a ring light right now for talks like this. So <laughs> the lighting's not so great in the room. Um, and, you know, technology tools, you know, our team is globally dispersed all around the world. So we have a ton of these tools like Slack for communication, Asana, for project management, uh, Miro. Uh, I feel like there's a, a dozen or so that we're using. 
um, from a business perspective. And I think one one little hidden one that, um, oh yeah, there's one more important one is, it's really important to have data on the phone, like a lot of extra data. So for example, this talk right now, I'm not using the Wi-Fi. It's, it's mm. pretty shoddy in most places I've been traveling. So the data is way more consistent. Um, so I use it as a hotspot. Um, but the, the one that most people don't know about that I love is there's this app called Crisp with a K. And mm. what that does is it, back, it, it, it silences the sounds from outside and only focuses on the voice. So if you're at a loud cafe or there's a neighbor next door that's making noise, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty brilliant how well it works. I'm using Crisp right now. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> they should they should give us commission for all the people that are gonna sign up for it now. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, so tools for me. Um, one of the biggest lifesavers that I use is a remote mailbox. So there's a few different brands that offer this, but it's great. I think even if I was to move back to the States full time, mm -hmm. I would still use it because I think it's better than regular mail. So basically, um, you know, it's, it's a relationship of trust that you have with the remote mailbox provider. They'll scan all your mail for you. If you need to mail something out, you could upload the PDF and they'll send it out for you. They have like a holding center if you need packages um, and you always get an email update whenever you get mail. So that's, that's been great. Um, another thing that's been great for me tool wise for getting my work done. Um, I have an international plan for my phone. So that's, that's helpful. You know, there's some people who like, they always get a SIM card as soon as they get to a different destination. I've done it in some places. Mm -hmm. um, but because I have like a lot of, you know, authentication stuff, you know, I just tend to keep my number. Um, Notion is one of my favorite remote work tools, um, just because, you know, with the team and eventually I, and I'm also a very big fan of asynchronous communication and work. I don't like meetings. So, um, if we can do, um, anything to just sort of work off of a document together, that's, that's great. Um, and Notion can do that. And even though this isn't necessarily a tool, um, I think it's, I've found it very helpful to have one of these digital banks where you can have an app to manage your um, your finances and be able to exchange uh, different currencies very quickly. Um, so, you know, I am trying not to do endorsements, but I'll just say that I have one right now and it's, it's very helpful. Um, oh, and then the last thing, even though this isn't necessarily a tool, mm -hmm. um, definitely have multiple checking accounts, at least two, I would say like four or five. I've had my ATM card uh, gobbled up at least four times in Mexico <laughs> by my machine. Um, they just, it's like, it's gone. It's not coming back out. And you know, the bank's like, mm, sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and get it happened to me many times again, those replaced can be a real pain, you know, mailing them internationally mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I like to add a quick one too. I just remembered there's yeah. a company called tossable digits and what it can do is it can take your phone calls and texts and voicemails from a, an American number, like mine mm -hmm. was six, four, six. And then it'll email you the text and voicemails or redirect the phone calls directly to your local SIM card. So that's yeah. been that's been amazing, especially with all those authentication things, I can still get my text. Oh, one other tool, and I'll give a shout out to one of our um, partners. It, well, it's not really a tool, but like travel insurance while you're on the road. Um, Cause you know, health insurance in the United States is so expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's awesome that Freelancers Union help, is helping freelancers find ways to get um, health insurance. But travel insurance is actually surprisingly affordable. So if you're on the road, um, I think it's really ethically important to make sure that if something happens to you, if you're hurt and you're not able to you know, pay for whatever is happening, you know, that, that can create a burden to the locals. So I think it's really important. So I just want to give a shout out to Insured Nomads who partnered with us on the event. You know, check them out. Um, so Mita, what are some surprising benefits of digital nomad nomading? Um, the productivity for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there, you know, like I was talking about, like one of the problems of digital nomading is this stereotype that people think that, oh, you're just goofing off all the time. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, this is like the motivation for me to work that much harder because yeah, I'm trying to go on this like river cruise or whatever have you on the weekend, you know? Um, so the productivity um exposure to different cultures you know when i was a kid i used to just i was one of those kids who used to like reading encyclopedias just so i could like read about different <laughs> countries oh yeah me too oh you see okay so you get it world book you know what i'm saying so it's like <laughs> 
so just having a front row seat to experience these cultures up front um, is just amazing. Um, and uh, just general wellness, mental wellness. Like I just feel so much more balanced in doing that. And, and I think that everybody eventually finds their nomad like home. You know, for Tarek, obviously it's Bali. For me, I definitely say it's Mexico. Um, and just getting off the plane in Mexico, it just sort of like eases me just going back. And Tarek? Surprises. Well, for me, I'd say it's about personal growth. Like I mentioned in my New York days, I was really prioritizing my professional growth. And I really surprised myself on how much I, I changed. I mean, when you take a, a big leap like this, you, you don't know what you don't know. And a lot of people say when people are exploring the world and traveling that it's about finding yourself. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big believer it's about creating yourself. It's about mm. seeking out those experiences that make you feel like you're coming alive. And, and when you're digital nomading, there's way more opportunities to, to seek out those experiences that, that, you're, that you're, your soul gravitates towards, you know? And, um, and also the people, you know, whether it's the local communities with their very rich cultures, or you know other adventurers or nomads there's it, there's more f opportunity to meet different people and to challenge your assumptions and to really like broaden new horizons like broaden your perspective and and um and then that ultimately leads to changing ideally for the better um through through these special connections great and i have i want to have a quick follow-up question to both of you on this because nita you brought up mental health and Tariq, you brought up earlier um, that sometimes digital nomadic can be lonely. So how were you able to balance or, you know, take care of your own mental health while being a digital nomad? So universe? I think, you know, just in this whole experience of the world becoming more remote and more comfortable with like different services that are remote, I actually have a remote therapist. So um, I want to give a shout out, actually. So eventually, actually, recently won a award, a cash award from Google for Startups, Black Founders Fund. Yes. Um, and uh, to get into the program, I had built a relationship with Google for Startups by being in a previous uh, program they have called uh, Founders Academy. And even though they didn't provide any um, cash injection via uh, Founders Academy, one of the things that they did give us was a free therapist. And it was a remote therapist. Um, and it was just really wonderful to have that and, and to know that no matter where I am around the world, I can, I can go and do that. So, um, for, for, for people who want to make sure that their health stays on track and, and that they're doing the right thing, yeah, you can, you can find an online therapist and I'd recommend it. It's been beneficial for me. Yeah, definitely. And Tariq, what about you? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I think it's such an important question that, Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's getting a little more attention, it's, it's still not, I don't think, prioritized enough. I mean, mental health is the most important thing. I mean, we're all here trying to live good lives and be happy. And, and you know, specific to the, a nomad life, like I said earlier, it can be lonely, um, especially in the beginning. And what I've realized, though, is that we grow through what we go through, right? So some of these challenges are actually benefiting us to overcome them. Um, and what I realized most importantly is the opportunity to seek, seek community and even create your own community. So what's, what's different from say, in my case, in many people's cases is the community from where you're from is based on a geographic location, you know, yeah. you're in, and maybe it's from the family and the school you went to. What's, what's interesting about community in the nomad world is it's, there's choice there. So you can seek out people that have like-minded values, shared passions. And, and that's really special because, you know, that's an opportunity for people to really connect at a deeper level mm -hmm. and maybe in their newer version of their, of who they are. Um, one, one little hack that I found along the way mm -hmm. to help with this idea of like mental health and, and overcoming loneliness is to, to actually create your own community. And part of that is actually creating an event, like literally mm -hmm. just reaching out either formally or informally, um, it's as simple as contacting a co-working hub and saying, Hey, can I have an event to talk about mental health as a nomad? And yeah. then they put it out there and then 10 people come and you have this shared interest that you can bond over. Um, and, and yeah, I would say, I would say creating community is probably the, the best solution to helping people with their mental health on the road. 
So talking about community, um, both of you created very different products for the digital nomad community, but both of you are including an element of social impact to your products, right? Um, especially Tarek, you know, with NGV. Can you both talk about it, um, talk a bit about what inspired you to do that with your products and why you find that so important? Tarek, you should go first, because this is where I think you really shine with what you're doing. <laughs> oh, thanks. So, yeah, I mean, for me, when I first left New York, mm -hmm. I, I found myself um, volunteering in, in these amazing places around the world, like Kenya and Sri Lanka, Zambia, China, Bali, and other places. And I just really fell in love with the feeling that I got from it, you know, in terms of feeling empowered to help others. You know, a lot of us, I think part of the mental health struggles out there is that sometimes we feel like, what difference can we make in this world, especially with so many of these massive challenges in society and in the environment. Um, but we really can. And it's so amazing to actually feel that you can. Um, so when I started, when I fell in love with the nomad movement, eventually, I, I, I would ask everyone like, so how are you connected with locals and how are you giving back to the communities? And most of the time they say the same thing. I don't know, but if you figure it out, let me know because I want to do the same thing. So, you know, when I heard this enough times, I recognized that there's this gap, this opportunity mm -hmm. to try to solve the problem. I want to get back. I don't know how. And to mobilize the collective power of the movement, you know, because the nomads and these expats were, were a collection of individuals. We're not like some big Goldman Sachs, you know, or some big company in New York that, that has a corporate social responsibility division. Um, so nomads giving back is our, our team's effort to help solve that problem, to try to help solve the question, I wanna give back and I don't know how, make it easier, uh, form a community of people that are socially conscious and like to connect with locals and serve as that bridge between foreigners and locals. And um, it's been a really beautiful mission. And, and, um, and I, think, uh, along, I think it's a good opportunity to mention along the way, we also launched Nomad Skillshare, mm -hmm. which is about um, helping to empower people with through skills, um, not just nomads, but especially including locals. And we have a buy one, give one scholarship program. Um, so every time someone buys a course, we give a scholarship to a less privileged student. And it's another great way for us to like share skills among the community, um, which I think solves a lot of different challenges, not just the disparity between mm -hmm. the privileged and the less privileged, but also creating community and helping to solve other challenges like mental health challenges. So um, I'm, I'm really proud of our team and I love in the direction we're going and um, it's, been, it's been a beautiful journey. And Mita? Yeah, so when I started eventually before the pandemic, it didn't have, it didn't really contemplate the whole sustainability impact aspect. Um, it wasn't something that I wasn't, I was focused on. What I saw started to happen after the pandemic, when there were so many people becoming digital nomads, I was like, okay, this is a giant wave that's coming and you can either ride that wave or that wave can crash. Yeah. Um, and when I say crash, like, you know, not sort of melding right with the local communities, mm -hmm. um, misdirected funds, you know, there are a lot of people that come down, they're wealthy, you know, they're, they're working remotely and they want to give money to the community, but they don't know how to channel that the right way. Or um, maybe they're not taking good care of the environment. And, you know, so it's a little bit selfish in that I want this lifestyle to keep going, not only for myself, but for all of our, our community and our members. And I started to think, well, I think this needs to be a really important part of what we do at Adventurely, you know, and it was also at a time to be, you know, very uh, honest where before we got the Google funding, I was like, and I was self-funding, I was like, okay, I got to really make sure that this is what I really want to do if I'm going to keep self-funding this and had to really examine what my why is. And when I did that, I was like, you know what, I want to build a product that I'm proud of that can help make the world a little bit better. Um, and so we started to incorporate a few different elements. So there's four elements of how we incorporate sustainability and local impact. Uh, for our one month welcome meetups, the first thing that we do is we prioritize working with local tours and providers that we arrange the experiences with. The second thing is that we offer a workshop for the people that are in the one month welcome meetups to learn about responsible ways to approach nomading. Uh, 
The third thing that we do is we share with them a few different local organizations that they can donate money to. And the last thing that we do is we personally donate 5% of proceeds from our welcome meetups to a local organization and the destination we host them in. So it's a small start, but, you know, I feel like, you know, you have to start with yourself. You have to start with the product you're building. And I think it's essential for other companies to do this as well, to make sure that this nomadism thing is a win-win and so that we're riding that wave instead of crashing it. Wonderful. Um, thank you for that. So one last question for both of you, um, for our listeners is, uh, what's the top three tips for aspiring freelance digital nomads? And we can kick it off to meet up first on that. God, I was just trying to remember what are my top three tips. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, top three tips, definitely have minimum of two checking account cards, debit cards. I, if you have four or five, go for it. <laughs> um, the other thing is if I would say, try to experiencing, um, nomading in like uh, another town or city in the country you're in. So mm -hmm. at a place like Mexico, it's very easy to go between Mexico City, Playa del Carmen, Oaxaca, Guadalajara, take advantage of weekend trips like that. Um, and the third is, you know, get your work done. That's, that's the foundation to making this lifestyle work. Get your work done. And you're going to want to when you see all the things that you can do on the weekends. <laughs> Great. And Tari? Yeah, sure. So I would say first is understand and remember your why, you know, why are you going after this lifestyle to begin with and try not to lose sight of it because it's, you know, a lot of us are doing this to step outside of our comfort zone and to leave behind some of these social norms. But then we go into this new place and we recreate those, those social norms. We end up hanging out with similar people with a similar background and similar language. And so I, I think it's important not to fall into the trap of recreating the same bubble that you came from and actually expanding your horizon by, by, um, by trying to meet new people with different backgrounds and doing different things. Um, second, I would say, you know, I am with Nomads Giving Back, so I would say connect with locals and give back to the local community. Um, there's a million reasons to do that, and I think you know what they are, but most importantly, it's not just helping locals, but it's helping yourself, you know, feeling a sense of empowerment and purpose. Um, and the third one, I would say set goals but not expectations, you know, it's, it's a journey for a reason, you know, it, it's a roller coaster. You don't know what's going to happen. And that's the whole point. You don't know who you're going to meet. You don't know how you're going to change. And I think it's really important to remain open to the possibilities and, and see where the path takes you. Great. Um, so for both of you, what's your favorite popular quote unquote digital nomad hub and fave that's not hyped up yet digital nomad destination. So I want two answers here. Um, so I'll go first. So I talk a lot about Mexico, so I can't. <laughs> I love Mexico. Um, so it would probably be Playa del Carmen, Mexico. It's super hyped up. Um, I think it's probably one of the biggest nomad destinations in Latin America. Um, and then another one uh, sort of also close by, I would say Antigua, Guatemala, even though I feel like it's starting to get that buzz. Yeah. <laughs> that, would be my, that would be my second city. What about you, Tarek? Oh, it's so hard to choose. Okay, so in terms of the popular ones, um, I'd say it's a tie between where I am now, Bali, and Medellin, Colombia, where I lived for some time. It's such an incredible country and culture. Um, I do like Buenos Aires a lot. I'm heading there soon to give a keynote at the Nomad Conference there. Very excited about that opportunity. One, a place that is less traveled that I think has a lot of potential and will very likely grow is Africa. And I know it's a huge continent. So places like, I spent a lot of time in places like Kenya, Egypt is my motherland, um, South Africa. I can see the, the rate of growth of nomads in those countries going, growing a lot faster than maybe the rest of the world over time. It, there's so much, so much value uh, in enriching culture there that people are gonna wanna go back again and again. Wow, that's awesome. Um, so I wanna wrap up with this last question for you all. Like, how can people find you and your products and what's next in the pipeline for both of you? Yeah, so you can find Adventurely at adventurely.app um, and all of our social handles are at Adventurely. What's next in the pipeline? Well, there's been a lot of support for the New York City Nomad Village experience. 
So I have a feeling this thing might have some legs for something more in the future. So um, if you think you see yourself in the future of this village experience, which we'd love to have you in, and when I say you, I mean anybody who's listening, just reach out to us, community at adventurely.app. And check out our welcome meetups. We have a few spaces remaining for our November welcome meetups in Playa del Carmen. And we have a bunch of new ones that are being launched for the spring. So check us out. All right. Um, yeah, sure. So you can find um, the great stuff our team are doing at nomadsgivingback.com, nomadskillshare.com. Um, and if you want to connect with me, I always love hearing from people. You can reach me on Instagram at tarek.world or in LinkedIn, Tarek Kalusi is my name. Uh, I think it's written right there. <laughs> and what's in the pipeline? Well, we're still early on, on on Nomad Skillshare. So we're rolling out courses all the time. We just rolled out one this past week and I look forward to growing more opportunities for people to come to us to, to learn various skills, especially in remote, remote work. Um, we'd love to invite anyone who's interested in giving back. You're welcome to uh, check out our free volunteer matching program or even join our team of volunteers. Uh, you, uh, you would really enjoy connecting with our amazing team around the world. Great. So I wanna thank you both for this insightful and wonderful conversation today and for the amazing work you're both doing across the world. Um, and I think this has been a very like interesting conversation and educational for a lot of people. Um, and I want to thank you both for that. And I will leave the floor to both of you to have any final comments before we sign off. Um, I have a final comment. How, do, how can people find Freelancers Union? You got to give your skill oh, yeah. too. And what's next in the what's in, what's what's next in the pipeline for Freelancers Union and Hub? Uh, well, the Freelancers Union. Um, you can find us at freelancersunion.org, um, and that's where you'll find all the resources that we provide. And within that will also be the Freelancers Hub. So if you're ever in New York City or in Brooklyn specifically, you come down to Industry City and Sunset Park, where we have this free co-working space um, for creatives and freelancers of any type, really. And if you want to rent out the space for an event or if you want to have you know, a photography studio or like a film session or anything like that, we, we have a space here for that. And, that's, and the space is dedicated to freelancers for that. So it's basically what I always tell any guest that comes in is that, it's like me casa su casa, this place is for you. Like I want you to make the most out of it. Um, and that's my message to everyone for that. Um, and that'll be it. I wanna say thank you all and, um, and we'll wrap it up now. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs> Hope to see you in the village again soon. Bye. Hey, thanks Mita, thanks Lori, this was really fun. And uh, enjoy the rest of the day in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> Brooklyn <laughs>